This will be the first in a series of recordings investigating the respiratory system, chapter 13 in our human physiology textbook. <clears throat> so here we have a diagram, a cartoon diagram showing the respiratory system. And the upper respiratory system consists of the nasal cavity, the space in the back behind your nasal cavity and your oral cavity, the pharynx, your throat. And then there's a little trap door right here called the epiglottis. So everything above that point, the larynx right here, uh, is the upper respiratory system. And then we have the trachea, bronchi, the primary bronchi, and the many, many branching branchings of the bronchi, the plumbing that carries the air down into the lungs until we get down to bronchioles, tiny bronchi. That's the lower respiratory system. The upper respiratory tract contains a lot of resident bacteria, commensal bacteria and fungi that just kind of hang out in there and, <clears throat> and they're no problem whatsoever. And so the air comes into the, into the nasal cavity and there's some kind of spiral shaped balconies of bone sticking out. These little ridgy things are supposed to represent those nasal turbinates that stick out from the, from the uh, lateral walls of the nasal cavity and create a lot of surface area of mucous membrane, uh, also covered with, with mucus covered hairs so that when the air comes in, it gets humidified by, by contact with all those, um, all that surface area of mucous membrane and also becomes warmed. So then the air, then the air transits down through the pharynx and into the lower respiratory tract. It's already nice and moist and warm. Also, it filters out a lot of dust and debris and bacteria and stuff on the mucous membranes and the hairs and so forth, which can be then swept out of the nasal cavity and then swallowed down into the, the stomach through the esophagus. <clears throat> All right, so the air comes down through the larynx into the lower respiratory tract, which is a, essentially a sterile environment. The, the epithelium, as you may remember from our first chapter in lab, is a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And on the surface of that mucous membrane, that epithelium, is a layer of mucus that's constantly being swept by the action of the cilia up and out of the lungs up to the larynx, and then it can be again swallowed down into the into the stomach, which is a big pot of, of acid to kill any microbes and so forth. <clears throat> this little diagram just shows us the branching of the of the airways, the trachea of the lower respiratory system forms the primary bronchi, and then the continued branchings until we get down to some very small tubes indeed. Once the, the bronchioles, as they're called, have actual air sacs, alveoli attached to them, where actual exchange of gases happens with blood capillaries. They're called respiratory bronchioles. And eventually we come down to the point where there's um, just clusters of air sacs, alveoli they're called. Um, there's about three to 500 million uh, alveoli in your two lungs. And that's where all the gas exchange happens with the blood, between the alveoli and the blood. It's down here in this respiratory zone. <clears throat> Here you can see the rich investment of capillaries around all these air sacs. The walls of the capillaries have a ton of, or walls of the alveoli have a ton of capillaries to pick up all the oxygen and to deliver the CO2 to the contents of the alveoli and, and exchange gases in that way. <clears throat> so this is just a description of words what I was just mentioning about the mucus escalator, the, the ciliated epithelium of the airways with that layer of mucus that can be swept out when, when debris and dust and bacteria stick to the sides of your airways uh, as the air comes tumbling in, we can sweep all that junk out and get rid of it. Here's a cartoon showing the, the alveoli in two dimensions. You cut through a part of the lung where you can see some of the ultra thin walls of the alveoli. Not in love with this diagram, makes it look like the alveoli have no uh, sort of um, spherical integrity whatsoever, which is not really true. But anyway, the idea is that there's an ultra-thin wall of the alveoli made up of a single cell thick epithelium and it's simple squamous epithelial cells. That's what makes up the alveoli. And those cells are called type 1 alveolar cells. They're the, they're the building material. That's what the walls are made of. So here's a type 1 endothelial or um, epithelial cell, alveolar cell. It has a basement membrane. Then we have another basement membrane here because epithelia form those dense little mats of, of protein underneath them. And then we have another epithelium, the endothelium of a capillary. <clears throat> and those layers represent, that's the respiratory membrane we call it. 
Oxygen has to diffuse from inside the air sac through the type 1 epithelium, type 1 cell epithelium, the basement membrane, another basement membrane, and then the endothelial cells and right into a red blood cell. So that's the that's the, the, the place where the diffusion happens. It's ultra thin because we have simple squamous epithelial cells. And it's always that way. And there's a lot of surface area, about 75 square meters. If you took all of the three to 500 million alveoli and spread them all out into a continuous sheet, it would be about 75 square meters. That's a lot of surface area in your lungs to exchange gases. Quite amazing. What else is in there? Well, there's some type 2 alveolar cells that are surfactant secreting cells. At the end of this section, we'll mention briefly surfactant when that's about. Uh, surfactant is a detergent-like substance that's in the water on the surface of this epithelium that helps make it easier to expand the alveoli. We need that surfactant to be there to really be able to breathe correctly. And then finally, there's some alveolar macrophages in there. And those macrophages will phagocytose, phagocytize any debris or bacteria that do manage to not get stuck to the wall of any mucous membranes all the way down and arrive in an alveolus, well then the macrophages are freely, freely moving along the surface of the alveolus. <clears throat> they can defend us against those kind of things and keep that alveolus clean for gas exchange. Here's a nice electron micrograph of some alveoli, cut in section of course. We can see the openings to these sphere-like structures. And you can see how ultra thin the wall is. All these ripples you see on the wall of the alveolus are the capillaries in the wall. And those type 1 alveolar cells are just draped over them so thin you almost can't even tell they're there. Um, on the, to give that ultra short distance for diffusion of oxygen and CO2. There's a higher magnification. And so in this ultra thin layer you see right here is both the type 1 epithelial cell, the endothelial cell, and the basement membranes. And that's all the distance that oxygen has to diffuse. The red blood cells are packed tightly in the capillaries. They're super elastic, and they're squeezed in there, single file essentially, and so that the rim of the red blood cell is touching the wall of the of the of the capillary all the way around, and most of the hemoglobin is therefore pushed to the perimeter of the cell, forming the shortest possible distance for diffusion between the hemoglobin and the red blood cell and the alveolar uh, gas. Pretty cool. The lungs are situated in the pleural cavities within the, th within the thoracic cavity. So the thoracic cavity is divided into the two pleural, left and right pleural cavities and the mediastinum in the center. <clears throat> so the pleural cavity is lined with an epithelial membrane called a serous membrane. This is this dark green kind of line is supposed to be. That's called the parietal pleura. Excuse me. <clears throat> and the parietal pleura is one epithelial layer, and then the lungs themselves are lined with an identical um, serous membrane called the visceral pleura. And those two membranes are opposed, directly opposed to each other, and there's a little bit of lubricant fluid in between them, allowing the lungs to glide effortlessly against the chest wall as they expand and contract. So those are the pleural membranes. <clears throat> and so oxygen comes into the body, from the, into the alveoli, from the atmosphere. Some of the oxygen diffuses into the blood. <clears throat> travels from the left heart out into the systemic arterial circulation and some of the oxygen diffuses over to the to the cells for their use. Cells produce CO2 by resp respiration. CO2 enters the blood and travels to the lungs to be breathed out into the atmosphere. So we have diffusion happening at the lungs between the alveoli and the blood that's called external respiration. But we have diffusion of gases happening between the systemic blood capillaries and the extracellular fluid, the interstitial fluid, and then the, therefore the cells. That's called internal respiration in this chapter. <clears throat> ventilation is what we call breathing in and out air. So we're going to call that ventilation from now on. It doesn't mean like when you open the windows to paint. It's the process of pumping air in and out of the lungs. And the flow of air, just like the flow of blood, is driven by a difference in pressure from one point to another. Whenever there's a higher pressure, air just flows from higher pressure to lower pressure. The flow is opposed by resistance. Just like with blood, there's some friction involved. It's not infinitely easy for the air to move. And so <clears throat> the narrower the diameter of the bronchioles, for example, the harder it is for the air to get through there. So that's what we mean by resistance. Resistance is the opposition to flow. <clears throat> well, 
when air comes into the alveoli, we're going to inspire air by reducing the pressure inside the alveolus. And we'll take a look at that more in a second. So that's how you inspire air. We reduce the pressure inside the alveoli less than the air out inside in the atmosphere outside our body. And so air just enters the respiratory system from high pressure outside to low pressure inside. And then when we, when we expire air, the way we do it is to raise the air alveolar pressure or the intrapulmonary pressure and blood or air just flows from the alveoli out into the bronchioles and bronchi and out into the atmosphere where there's lower pressure. So we're gonna make some pressure changes. How in the world do we do that? <clears throat> Well, let's look at these little cylinders and, and, and examine the principle of Boyle's Law. If we have a set amount of gas inside of a container at a certain temperature, all those massive particles are moving at very high velocities and striking the walls, and that forms pressure. The, the, the momentum of those particles striking the walls creates a force acting on the walls, and we know that pressure is the force per unit area acting outward on these walls by these in this case, air molecules. Okay, so that's pressure one, for example, in a volume one. Now, if we take this exact same container with, without changing the number of air molecules and reduce the volume, now there's many more collisions happening because they're packed in tighter. There's a lot more molecules striking the walls per unit time. That's a greater pressure. So Boyle's Law says that if you decrease the volume without changing the amount of gas or the temperature, the pressure will go up. And it'll go up in such a degree that if the product of the initial pressure and volume will be equal to the product of the, of the final pressure and volume. So here we have a smaller volume and we have a, an increase in pressure and, and the product is the same as it would have been in this first case. <clears throat> if we increase the volume of the, of the container with the same number of air molecules, then there's less collisions, the pressure will go down, right? So if we raise the volume, pressure goes down. If we lower the volume, the pressure goes up. That's how we operate our lungs. That's how we inspire air into the lungs. How are we going to do that? <clears throat> Let's skip over this slide and go to this slide. There's a different principle. Before I go on to saying how we actually do that, how we inspire and expire air, <clears throat> I want to mention something about the construction of the chest wall and the, and the lungs themselves. We keep the alveoli always inflated. It's like when you blow up a balloon, right? It suddenly expands and there's some air in there and the wall is kind of stiff. It's got some tension there. That's because there's pressure of air inside there. And that's how your alveoli all, all the time. They're, they're stretched, they're elastic and they've been stretched, filled with air. And all we do is expand them somewhat when we breathe in air and then we contract them a bit when we breathe out air, but they're always elastic and stretched. So of those 300 million alveoli, each one is like a balloon pulling inward. And that's what's meant by this arrow. Elastic recoil is what we mean. Well, we mean the, the pulling inward of the elastic walls of all those alveoli. The, this purple lung is trying to shrink down. The chest wall is an elastic box made of bone and cartilage and muscle. And it's also very elastic. And if we pull inward on it, the more we pull in, the stiffer it gets and the more it begins to resist us pulling any farther. And so if you can imagine starting out with, with just the thorax with nothing in there, and we just suddenly insert this inflated lung in there and seal it up and watch what happens. The elastic lung will pull inward and drag the chest wall in a little bit with it because, right, there's just a little bit of, of serous fluid between the two pleural membranes. They made a giant space because they thought you wouldn't be able to understand. Um, so we have this, as we pull inward on the chest wall more and more, it begins to resist. It gets stiffer. It's like stretching a rubber band or a balloon. Uh, this time it's the chest wall. So the chest wall is now pulling outward because we've pulled it inward a bit. The lungs are still trying to, to collapse down because the alveoli are still inflated. And so at rest, when you're not doing anything, not even breathing, there's tension. The chest wall pulling outward and the, and the, and the lungs pulling inward. <clears throat> the effect of those two opposing forces is that in the intrapleural space, the space between the two pleural membranes, there's essentially a vacuum, a lower pressure in there because those forces. What if we punctured a hole through the chest wall? Because this is a lower pressure in here than the atmosphere around, 
if we punctured a hole through the chest wall, air would go rushing in from higher pressure out here to lower pressure inside, and the, wall, the chest wall would expand and the lungs would contract down. The lungs would actually collapse as air filled in the space between the pleural membranes. The space would begin to grow. That's called a collapsed lung or atelectasis. Atelectasis. Or what if we had an entry to the lung itself? Imagine just if this was just a simple, simple lung with just one chamber and it's filled with, and it's elastic and it's pulling inward and it's filled with air. If we tore off one little corner of it so the air could escape into this intrapleural space, the same thing would happen. Air would come in from outside through the lung and fill up that space and allow that lung to collapse through its elastic recoil and, and, and we'd have a collapsed lung. So either one of those things can happen in real life, a trauma, can cause collapse, cause a puncture of the chest wall, an injury to the lung. Some people are predisposed to having lung injuries of this type in which the, the they have a collapsed lung and have to have some assistance to get it reinflated. Okay, now let's talk about actual inspiration and expiration. <clears throat> the way we inspire air is to increase the volume of the thoracic cavity. The thorax and the lung volumes are going to be increased. How do we do that? At rest, you contract your diaphragm muscle. That's all it takes. It's a dome-shaped muscle underneath your lungs. When you flatten it down as it contracts, it pulls the lungs down with it. It expands the volume, right? And according to our little diagram showing Boyle's Law, if we expand the volume of the lungs, what happens? The pressure decreases in there. That's exactly what happens. The pressure in the lungs decreases. The pressure in the alveoli and air just enters from outside your body into the, into the alveoli. By, from higher to lower pressure. Um, incidentally, if you're exercising, there are numerous other muscles that are involved in lifting up your rib cage, which also helps increase the volume of your thorax. And you get a much more um, impressive increase in volume and decrease in pressure, more air comes in. <clears throat> How about expiration? Expiration occurs by lowering the volume in the thorax. When you're just at rest, like if you're sitting here reading this and you're breathing at rest, all you have to do is relax the diaphragm muscle. No contractions need to take place. The moment you relax the diaphragm, the elastic recoil of all the alveoli will cause the, the lungs to, to contract down, and take up that, you know, get rid of all that um, extra volume that was, that was produced when the, when the diaphragm contracted. So if we raise the, or lower the volume, and have the same amount of gas, the pressure goes up. So alveolar pressure rises and air just flows out from higher pressure inside the lungs to lower pressure outside the lungs. Incidentally, again, as you probably um, imagine or knew during exercise, we have some muscles that can haul down the rib cage, flatten the ribs more against the, the, the spine and reduce the volume of the thorax and help push the air out, make a bigger pressure difference, a bigger delta P to push that air out of the lungs so we can breathe more deeply. So <clears throat> that's this little drawing just talks through all those through those things that we've just been talking about. If you want to inspire air, we'll simply increase the volume and that makes the pressure go down. And you're seeing this minus one millimeter of mercury pressure in the lungs that causes air to rush into the lungs. And then when the lungs are completely full, then we, we stop bringing it, we stop um, having a negative pressure. We have zero pressure inside and outside this. We, we just call the pressure zero when it's equal outside the body and inside the body. And then when you expire air, you cause the volume to decrease. Now we see a, a positive pressure in the alveoli. And so um, <clears throat> if there's higher pressure inside the lungs than out in the atmosphere, air just rushes out until we reach, we finish emptying the lungs and then the pressure difference is, is zero. I should mention to you that outside of our body, the pressure of air is not zero. It's 760 millimeters of mercury. So there's a lot of air pressure outside of us. But what we mean by this is when we, when you finish expiring air and your airways are open to the outside, but there's nothing moving, um, there's also 760 millimeters of mercury pressure inside. They're, they're the same. And so it's easier just to write zeros than write 764 out here and 764 in here or something like that. <clears throat> the resistance to flow of air. There is opposition to flow. What are the things that impact that? The biggest thing that impacts that is bronchoconstriction or bronchodilation. Inflammatory chemicals, if you get some inflammation in the lungs, histamine is the primary one, 
but also prostaglandins and leukotrienes. Those are inflammatory mediators released by mast cells and some other immune cells, basophils. That causes bronchoconstriction. The muscular bronchioles shrink down and make it harder for air to move in and out. That's what happens when someone has a, an a, a asthma attack, for example. Constricting those airways, raising the resistance, very hard to get the air in and out. Also, mucus secretion. Inflammation usually also involves secretion of extra mucus, which sort of reduces the caliber or bore diameter of those, of those bronchioles. Again, makes the resistance go up, harder to breathe. So, <clears throat> things that make the, air, the resistance go up. Um, interesting thing, when an asthma attack happens and mast cells are activated that release histamine and these other mediators, somehow also, Parasympath ner parasympathetic nervous system is involved. The parasympathetic nervous system releases acetylcholine, which causes bronchoconstriction. But in this case, we have an unusual and abnormal amount of bronchoconstriction due to this exaggerated irritation in response to some chemical trigger, usually, or even just really cold, dry air. Some people are, are um, um, get, or even just during exercise, some people get this really aggressive bronchoconstriction happening, and it has something to do with activating parasympathetic neurons causing bronchoconstriction. <clears throat> Another thing, anaphylaxis, allergy. Anaphylaxis just means an allergic reaction in which immunoglobulin type E, which is one of the types of antibodies that can be produced by your, by your immune system, after you have an immune response that produces this particular class of antibodies, these antibodies will remain after that, attached to mast cells all along your, your blood capillaries and so forth and connective tissues. And if the same antigen, foreign substance, which we now call an allergen, comes into your body and binds to those IgEs, those antibodies stuck to the surface of the mast cells, that'll trigger the mast cells to degranulate, release their histamine, and will have bronchoconstriction. So when you have an allergic reaction in your lungs, either inspire some allergen or you eat something that goes into your digestive system that goes then into the blood and then it circulates throughout your body. It's going to cause massive bronchoconstriction and, and mucus production. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what that's, as I was mentioning, is interesting sort of um, resurgence of, of knowledge about the parasympathetic role in this, in this bronchoconstriction is becoming important because if that's true, then we can use um, muscarinic antagonists, muscarinic receptors are receptors for the acetylcholine from the parasympathetic nervous system. We can use specific muscarinic antagonist drugs that can help ameliorate the, the uh, anaphylactic response and also as well with asthma. So that's something that's, that's really taking off now in, in, uh, in um, medical research for new drugs. <clears throat> Factors that decrease um, 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 resistance. Epinephrine and drugs that act like epinephrine. So epinephrine causes bronchodilation. As we know, we've talked before about albuterol, which is a beta-2 agonist, meaning it acts like epinephrine in the lungs and causes the airway smooth muscle to relax so that people with asthma can take a puff of their inhaler and it'll act like epinephrine there and cause bronchodilation. Someone has a severe allergic response, right? Uh, not going to wait around to see if a parasympathetic agonist can be found inject some, some epinephrine right into the body and cause bronchodilation. It will override the constriction so that the person doesn't suffocate in response to some allergen like a bee sting or whatever they're very allergic to. <clears throat> lung compliance has to do with the elasticity. How easy is it to stretch the lung tissues and structures? So that's what compliance means. If there's high compliance, it's really easy to stretch them. Very little force stretches. If there's low compliance, it's much harder. So that affects resistance, the ease with which you can breathe air in. Um, <clears throat> if the lung is in some way affected, that'll change the compliance, the elasticity, and same with the chest wall. So <clears throat> let's say your chest wall, I'm sure a slide is coming up, as you age, the chest wall starts to become ossified, it's stiffer, compliance goes down, it's a lot harder to bring air in. Surface tension. It's very strange, but if you can imagine the water molecules that line the layer of water on the surface of your alveoli are all have an electric charge, a partial charge. They're like a little dipole, a little negative and positively charged object, and they all stick to one another because they all have these positive and negative charges. And so in order to expand an alveolus, you have to overcome those 
those gripping magnetic, almost electrical attractions of trillions of water molecules. And that takes work. It's actually hard to do it. When you have three to 500 million alveoli and you try to stretch them all at once, it's hard work to, to overcome that surface tension of water molecules. Well, in order to, in, to overcome that problem, your type two alveolar cells secrete a detergent called surfactant and it reduces the surface tension. It kind of weasels in between all those water molecules and lets them pull apart effortlessly, and it's very easy to expand the alveoli. It also serves the purpose of preventing alveoli from collapsing into each other. <clears throat> Interesting point, premature infants don't have surfactant production online yet. Their lungs weren't intended to be breathing air yet. They were supposed to still be in the womb, and they weren't ready. And so their type 2 cells are not on board, and so they won't be able to breathe on their own if they're sufficiently premature. They don't have enough surfactant. They can't inflate their lungs. They can't breathe adequately. And so we have to give them an alveolar lavage, put some fluid down into the lungs that contains some surfactant for them to sort of allow, to give them to replace or to provide them the surfactant they don't yet have. And if we can keep helping them out in that way, then eventually they'll start to produce their own surfactant and breathe on their own. Sometimes ventilators are also used. Put that little preemie right on a ventilator and pump air into the lungs. But it's been discovered that that is destructive. Forcing air into the lungs under pressure from outside damages the lungs. We'd much rather have the lungs work in the normal way by, by using muscles to lower the pressure inside and pull air in. Uh, so we use uh, some, a, a process called lavage to get some, some um, surfactant down into the lungs. Some infants die of, of this infant respiratory, uh, can't say it, distress syndrome, IRDS, very scary thing for young parents to think about. Nobody really knows what to do about how to prevent it. It's very rare, but occasionally an infant will just suddenly stop breathing and expire. So things that reduce compliance, what are some things that could reduce compliance? Diseases in the lungs called fibrosis in which chronic irritation in the lungs has produced uh, uh, inflammation and scarring, essentially, in which collagen has been added. Collagen is, you know, heavy-duty building material. The lungs are gossamer thin, ultra-delicate, elastic alveoli. You add some heavy-duty collagen fibers in there, it just stiffens everything right up. Can't expand those alveoli properly anymore. Blockage of small airways. If you have pneumonia, that's a major inflammation being caused by bacteria growing in your lungs or viruses. Um, then you have fluid in there, and that adds to the resistance. A ton of mucus. You have bronchitis. That's a chronic inflammation in your lungs. Mucus is in there, and it's going to um, block the movement of air. That's going to decrease the compliance. If something happens to surfactant production, reduce compliance. Ossification, meaning forming bone from where there was cartilage in your rib cage as you age, reducing compliance. So. For example, if we look at this green line, that represents the relationship between the pressure difference from inside and outside of your lungs and the amount of volume in your lung. So if we, if we make a bigger pressure difference and cause air to exit from the lungs, or just the opposite, we can make a pressure difference and cause air to be drawn into the lungs, it follows along this green line normally. But what if we have a decreased compliance for a given Transpulmonary pressure, meaning difference between inside and outside, if we reduce the compliance, all of a sudden the volume in the lungs is now down here for that given difference in pressure. Here's how much we were able to inspire under normal conditions with a compliant lung. There's the tiny amount of air we were able to inspire with the non-compliant lungs. Or what if you have emphysema and you have degradation of the lung tissues? The compliance actually goes up, and so it's really, really easy to expand the lungs but the problem is that it becomes very hard to get the air back out again. We'll talk about that another time. Here's a quick little thing about um, that the physicists have given to us, for better or for worse. Um, <clears throat> the T here represents surface tension around these alveoli. And the surface tension is equal in each of these two alveoli. This is two very disparately sized alveoli. The pressure in the alveoli is not going to be the same because the pressure in the alveolus is related to the surface tension in the radius by this formula. So if you have a very different radius in two different alveoli, the pressure inside them is going to be different. And, and the point is the outcome, the, the, the upshot of it is that the pressure in the smaller alveolus will be 
will be less than the pressure in the larger alveolus, and what will happen is <clears throat> the large, smaller alveolus will collapse into the larger one. Right? It has an elastic wall, the pressure is lower, or actually the pressure is higher, I'm sorry, and so higher pressure, blood air flows from higher pressure to lower pressure, and, and the alveolus will collapse. Well, in the presence of surfactant, though, that doesn't happen. Surfactant has unique properties that change the surface tension in the two alveoli roughly so that they offset the difference in radius. We wind up with a pressure that's equal in two alveoli, even if they're different sizes and they don't collapse. <clears throat> All right, so join me next time and we'll talk about assessing lung function using a, a, a process or a technique called spirometry. We'll talk about partial pressure of gases, which is the way we're going to talk about quantities or concentrations of gases effectively in different places in your body, and this idea of ventilation-perfusion coupling in the lungs.